Beginning at verse 32, the writer to Hebrews in chapter 11 says, And what more shall I say? You've been waiting for him to say that. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and of Jephthah, the judges, and of David and the kings, which are not mentioned, but David, of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, they waxed valiant in the fight. Of course, we think of David and Goliath and the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel and the lions, Samson and the lions. I mean, you can, as we go through and look at the the characters of the judges and the kings and then the prophets and then all of the exploits, you can put those things together in your own mind. And it says here that they, uh, they wax valiant in the fight. They turn the flight, the armies of, enem- of the aliens and enemies. Women receive their dead, raised to life in the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. And others, al- uh, alloy, others of the same kind, of the same mind, I believe, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, a better resurrection than the, the women's children that were raised again. And, and the idea is, look, uh, the, the writer is saying, I could go on and on. You know, just think of all of the judges and the kings of Israel and the prophets that accomplished great triumphs of faith that did all of these great things through trusting the Lord. Uh, And and it says, even those who refused deliverance of their own will, they decided I'd rather be tortured. I'd rather than compromise my faith in the Lord. I would rather give up my life uh, and and expecting to obtain to a better resurrection. Hebrews 11, 1, the, the chapter is about the just shall live by faith and that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then when it gets to verse 36, it uses a different word, others, heteroi, others of a different kind. And I believe now we, you know, the, the writer of this epistle to the Hebrews now begins to switch to people who n- not by their own uh, desire end up in very difficult situations, facing death, facing illness, facing torture, facing hardship. And you know, I think I see God's wisdom in the way this chapter ends because probably the majority of us will never be in an experience where we see the Red Sea parted or, you know, we see the great exploits of, of faith and we appreciate those things. And I believe we should trust God for the best. I don't believe there's anything, uh, such a thing as pessimistic prayer. I think prayer is optimistic, and I think as David said when he was fasting and praying for the child that was born from Bathsheba that died, that while the child was alive, he said, who could tell whether God will be gracious? Now that the child is gone, I know God's will. But the idea is, is prayer is an optimistic thing. When I look at the ministry of Jesus Christ, I don't see any blind men or lepers or parents coming to him saying, well, you can heal my kid if you want to, and if you don't, I understand. They all come and grab a hold of him and say, heal my child, stop my blood flow, cleanse my leprosy, open my eyes. I mean, They come very expectant because of who he is. And I think that's the way we should pray. But we also need to realize there are times in our lives when we don't understand the pain. We don't understand the hardship. We don't understand why God is allowing things to take place in our lives. And at those times, it is the exact same faith that is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen that is exercised. And I think that's important because we look at these triumphs of faith, but we don't want to view the end of the chapter as tragedies of faith. They are also triumphs. It isn't like we have winners and losers in faith. You know, God is going to tell us these are people of whom the world is not worthy. They exercise, as it were, a greater faith uh, because they don't see the evidence of what God's word is telling them, of his love and of his faithfulness, they are going through a very difficult circumstance. And I think it's important for us. Let's read from 36 to the end. Others of a different kind had trial of cruel mockings, scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds of imprisonment, to speak of official persecution, it seems, those words. Others were stoned. They were sawn in half, uh, the, the... 
uh, Talmud says, I believe, uh, that um, Isaiah was sawn in half with a wooden saw. It been bad enough with a sharp metal saw. Sawn in half with a wooden saw. Others were sawn in sunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute. The idea is not even be able to afford clothing and food. Poverty. Destitute. You know the word. They were afflicted, hard-pressed, some of your scriptures may say, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report from God through faith, received not the promise singular, God having provided some better thing for us. We were involved in all this that they without us should not be made complete or perfect. So uh, as, as we look at this, we, we're going to go through and see what he's saying here in regards to all of these triumphs of faith and great things that we see in the life of Moses and Abraham and Noah and so forth. But now he comes to others of a different kind. He said that endured great hardship of one kind or another and still trusted God. And he's going to say that's the exact same faith. And and I think this is very important because today in the church, particularly in America, there is a, a theology that if you are suffering or if you are sick or if you're in poverty, that it is your fault, that it is because there is a lack of faith or it is because there is sin in your life. And uh, the word of faith movement has enforced this on the minds of God's children, many of whom begin to believe that God no longer cares for them or that God is getting at them because of the hardship in their life, which does not agree with the scripture. And what it says here, you know, the problem is people get into a circumstance where they're going through something hard or going through something terrible or, or, or somebody gets healed or they get healed or they, they see deliverance. And then what they, they say is, well, this is how you have to exercise faith to get this particular result. Then they write a book and they put out sets of tapes and uh, this is how you do it and this is how it works and this is what you get. And that disagrees with Hebrews chapter 11 because it says the first first half of the chapter says these men and women exercised faith towards God. It was in regards to a particular promise, but they saw great things happen in their lives. The second half says there were others who exercised the same faith towards God and they, and they lived and endured tragedy until they died, not receiving the promise. And it's wrong and dangerous for someone to form a theology from subjective experience and say, you know, this is what I did, this is what happened, so it must apply to everyone. It disagrees with the scripture. And I personally know of those word of faith leaders, one of the most prominent in our nation, who took ill and was put in the hospital and the whole thing was kept secret because it was bad for his theology until he recovered because his illness by his own theology would either have been a result of lack of faith or sin. So when he took ill and was, was placed in the hospital, the whole thing was hushed up by his organization until it was over. And that is not uncommon. And I think that we have to be careful. People do the same thing with the Holy Spirit. And here's, here's the problem. They form a theology that, and, and it's having faith in faith instead of faith in God. And, and in the faith movement, faith becomes a power that is disassociated from the personality of God. They do the same in the Holy Spirit. You hear people talk about the Holy Spirit like, you know, the oil was dripping from the ceiling and the, you could feel the power of God and my hair was standing up and I had goosebumps on my arms and the electricity was in the room and woo, you know. And, and, and the problem with that is if you perceive the Holy Spirit as a power, the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force and the question becomes, you, by your Christian practice, how much of the Holy Spirit do you have? The truth is, from the scripture, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? Because the Holy Spirit says, has a heart, has a mind, has feelings, is a person. There isn't anything that Jesus or God is that the Holy Spirit isn't. 
So the Holy Spirit is a person who desires to control our lives, whom we grieve, who his heart breaks over us. He loves us. He thinks about us. He directs the church. He has a plan for our lives. If we see him as a power, it becomes an impersonal power. And and then we become the one who is wielding this power of the Holy Spirit. Whereas if we realize the Holy Spirit is God and loves us, the question becomes how much of our lives are we yielding over to his control? It's the same thing with faith. Faith is not unconnected from a personal sovereign God. And it isn't as though faith, you know, is the magic lamp. You know, faith is the way we rub the lamp. And if we rub the lamp the right way, then the genie has to come out and perform because we've said the right words. I've got two boys, you know, Mikey's going to be 14 this summer. And Josh is eight years old. And I kind of like knives. I like pen knives and I like sheath knives. I like a sword, you know, I'm just sick, I guess, but I like knives, you know, and, uh, and, the, and they'll ask me from time to time, dad, can I have a pen knife? Can I have a pen knife? And in my mind, I'm thinking stitches. You know, if I give this kid a knife, I'm going to the emergency ward. So I say no to them, not now. And it isn't because I'm I'm a knife hoarder. Uh, It isn't because I don't love them. Uh, it, It is for their benefit that I say no. But if they say to me, Dad, you know, I want a knife in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I don't go, oh, that's the magic saying. I have to give them a knife now. Oh, they use the magic word, you know. And, and some people portray God that way, you know. You say, in the name of Jesus. And he goes, oh, that's it. I can't refuse now. They've got me over the barrel. They use the magic formula. You know, thank God that he's in control. And we are not. And people perceive him that way and perceive faith that way. And it isn't biblical. It isn't the picture that's being painted for us as we for months have looked at the idea of biblical faith in that, yes, there are people that have accomplished great things through faith, but the, the real issue of that faith is attached to a particular promise and, it, and it, has to, it operates in a realm of the future and the realm of the unseen, the things hoped for and the things not seen. It doesn't operate in the realm that the faith confessors put it in of you prospering and seeing the evidence right before you in your hands right now. And you can't preach that gospel again in Africa or in Yugoslavia today or where people are suffering and they're in hardship, but you can preach the gospel of Christ to any sinner in any condition. It's an American disease that you can't preach to most of the people on the planet. And if persecution and suffering comes here, they ain't going to be on TV anymore. And I think it's important for us to understand when we go through hard circumstances that not only is that whole teaching wrong, but it it destroys the faith of those that are enduring hardship and yet trusting Christ many times. I, of course, think of Corey Ten Boon and what she endured a remarkable faith or Johnny Erickson being a quadriplegic in a wheelchair saying I'd rather be a quadriplegic and know Christ than to have had my health maintained and never to have known him and yet I hear some of these faith guys say sure Johnny's being used of God but if she only had faith she'd get out of that wheelchair you know I'd like to grab one of those guys take him out behind the church you know and just you know just you know you just get you so mad nobody would believe them they believe me you know Doesn't it aggravate you? Think of Christian believers in Rwanda and Africa today that have watched their families slaughtered, Christian families, that have watched family members die of the Ebola virus. Think of Serbians and Croatians and Bosnians that are brothers and in the same family and being forced to take up arms against one another. And the pain that that Christian families are experiencing as we are sheltered here. I had opportunity to uh, hear Lydia Vashenka personally, who had been in uh, the American embassy in Moscow for seven years in the basement, hid out with her family until Mike McIntosh actually was involved with a negotiation. The family was released, and she spoke to us at a pastor's conference and just talked about life as a Christian 
and the Soviet Union, how they would break in in the middle of saying grace at the table and beat her father till he was unconscious and take away their Bibles. And finally, they came in one day and, and drug them apart. She said, at eight years old, all I remember is having my, uh, two handfuls of my mother's dresses in my hands as I, I didn't see my family again for 16 years. And she said, I didn't understand because at eight, I thought my parents could protect me from anything. And just talks about the experience they went through and how they endured and how, you know, it was, it was 18, 20 years later, they got off finally a plane in Geneva and they all had Praise the Lord t-shirts on as they got off the plane. What great and remarkable faith. And I think, you know, some of us stagger when we don't get the raise that we were hoping to get. Oh, God, do you still love me? I thought I was going to get rich. You know, you know. Or, or, or some of us, we rush back to the department store because we saw a sweater, and when we saw it, we didn't have the money on us, and we know God wants us to have that sweater, so we run home and get the money. By the time we get back, the sweater's gone, and we think, that's it. He's turned his back on me. He's forgotten about me. I know he's given his son and everything, but he took this sweater. You know, think of the things that we stagger over. And what it's is is pointing us to this group of people and talking about the tremendous faith that they have. I think of Acts chapter 12, Peter and James. James is put to death and Peter is spared miraculously. The same God, the same prayer meeting going on, both men with the same faith towards God. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the remarkable statement, our God is able to deliver us and if not, we will not bow down and worship your image. That's a remarkable thing to say. And if not, we still. If that's his will for us to be burned, we still. He's going to deliver us one way or another, either through the fire or through a miracle. I think of Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verse 13, where he says, You know, it was through infirmity that I first preached the gospel unto you that were in the air of Galatia. He doesn't say, despite the fact I was sick, I pressed on. He said, it was because of my sickness that I ended up here. He's saying, God used this illness in my life to direct my path and bring me to this plateau of Galatia where all these churches were born. It was through that that this took place. And yet there would be those who would say to Paul, well, it was, it was a lack of faith that you were sick. Paul said, no, it was the hand of God that allowed me to be sick that brought me to this place and he used it in a powerful and remarkable way. I think of Job's counselors and I'll tell you the mistake that they make and they still make it today. We can say to someone, if we see them in rebellion or we see them sinning against God, we see them backsliding. We know there's a process of sowing and reaping that the Bible is clear about. And, and, and it is true. And it works the way God says it does. So we can say to them, if you are rebelling and you are sinning and I see your behavior, what you will reap is this. It will produce this in your life ultimately. And we can say that correctly. We can assess their rebellion or their, their backsliding or their sin and say that will lead to this if you don't turn back. So from the front end, we can correctly assess that and say this behavior will lead to God's chastening if, if you're his child and he loves you. The thing that we can't do, and this is the mistake that people make, it's the mistake that Job's counselors make, we can't look at the person from this end already in their hardship and then assume that they got there because there was a lack of faith or sin in their life. That is the error. We can't look at someone suffering, someone in hardship, someone in poverty and say, well, obviously you're in this circumstance because you sinned against God or you're in rebellion. There was a lack of faith. That is an error. You can do that from the front end and say, if you rebel and if you sin, God will chasten. But we can't look at someone suffering and assume the reason they're there is because they did something wrong. Because it tells us right here, there are times when God in his sovereignty allows those things in the life of a believer. That doesn't make it easier to swallow, but it's important for us to know in the pain that God is not against us. Because we easily condemn ourselves and we don't need the help of anyone else condemning ourselves. We're ready to believe it without any help. It's hard enough to believe it if you're here this morning and you're suffering. And, and I will say from here that God s still loves you even though your circumstances tell you differently. It's hard enough for you to believe that. Let alone, let alone our tendency to believe, well, he's getting me. He's had it with me. This is it. He's writing me off. He's giving me what I deserve. 
Well, we all deserve it. If he gave us what we deserve, we'd all be in hell. All of us. The remarkable thing is he hasn't given us what we deserve. He's dealt with us in grace and in mercy and through atonement. So it's very wrong for us to look at someone suffering and assume that they're there because there is fault on their own. James was not suffering because he was in rebellion. He was beheaded for being in the direct will of God. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, says, Him and Silas despaired of life itself. He said, We were so pressed out of measure, we wished we were dead. He said, Except except for the great hope that we had in Christ. Matthew was skinned alive in Iran for serving Christ. They believe Thomas was impaled in India for serving Christ. Peter was crucified upside down, not for sin, but for serving Christ. John was banished to Patmos and alone for serving Christ, not for sinning. And what it's telling us here is there have been and always will be through the ages believers who suffer tremendous hardship, who are pressed out of measure, who are destitute, who are afflicted, who in those circumstances exercise tremendous faith because their faith is connected to something they are yet hoping for and it is connected to something that is unseen in the spiritual realm, that they are able to endure the hardship of their present circumstance because they have hope where an unbeliever does not. They are able to see a light at the end of the tunnel and to use the jargon we understand. And look at God's assessment of them here as we look at this and I think it's very important. First, it tells us, verse 38, of whom the world is not worthy. And, and yet, see, see the, the Word of Faith movement would tell you that if you're suffering, you're not worthy of the kingdom because you're sinning or there's a lack of faith. You're not taking the kingdom things or embracing the kingdom things. If you're in hardship and you're suffering, you're not worthy of the kingdom. No, no, no. God says... My children that go through tremendous hardship, my heart breaking the whole time, as I look at them, all I can think is the world is not worthy to have them among them. Only the kingdom is worthy of those believers. And see how some have turned it backwards. I think it's very important for you to understand this morning in your hardship if you're going through that time, that God, your Father, as he looks at you, his heart says, the world isn't even worthy for them to be there. Secondly, as I look at this, it says they've obtained a good report. These all having obtained a good report through faith. That, that they may get a bad report down here from men, but they're getting a good report from God as he assesses and he watches that in the eternal records, what is recorded is their faith. You know, it's interesting as he mentions, as I look at this, Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and Samson and David, you know, he doesn't mention any of their flaws. This, this writer of the Hebrews could have said, what more could I say about these guys? They really blew it. Let me give you this list. None of that's written. God takes note of their faith, of their heart. And lastly, and I think very importantly, it says in the end of 39 and the beginning of 40, these all have obtained a good report through faith. They received not the promise, singular, God having provided a better thing for us, They received not the promise because God was providing. Some of your Bibles will say God foresaw something better for us. The idea is God's sovereignty was involved. They were suffering. They were in hardship. Yet God overrode their plea to see their hopes answered right then because God looked down through the ages and saw us. In other words, I got saved in 1972. I was born in 1950. If Jesus Christ would have come in 1960, I would have never got in. 
So believers that were suffering died in the in, in 1950s, 1960s, God having foreseen something better for us. He waited. They never received the promise singular that we find all the way through Hebrews, which is the Messiah and his coming kingdom. The kingdom and the Messiah have not come to establish itself because God is withholding that, seeing men and women that will be saved. And I'm glad he didn't come in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, I got saved in 1972. Now he can come to heck with everybody else. I want to get going here, you know. <laughs> Is that the way you feel? And yet, yet he endures. He waits because there are those that will yet be saved. That if he were to return today, may never enter into the kingdom. And that is what our faith should be attached to. Peter says this, that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, that our faith is connected to our salvation and his kingdom ready to be revealed in the last time. Again, Peter says this, that, that as we believe, though we have not seen, that we love him, we rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. And again, he says, receiving the end of your faith. Faith is a means unto an end. And it is not prosperity and it is not, you know, health. Faith is a means unto an end. It says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Biblical faith is attached to Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his kingdom. It is not attached to prosperity and to health. That is a diseased gospel that you can't preach in the rest of the world where people are sick and broke. And if you're here this morning and you're sick or you're broke or you're going through tremendous hardship or you're one of those who have just lost someone and, and, and not received that person back by faith, you need to listen to God's estimation of your life and of your faith and not to men who would put you down because you're not seeing the results that they think you should see with the misunderstanding they have of what biblical faith is. God loves us. And I believe God is honored by us when we continue to trust him through the tough times because the world is a place that is filled with suffering and we will have greater opportunity to minister to a lost world not through our successes, but through our hardships. If our God, and he is, is sufficient to keep us and uphold us through the heartbreak and the difficulties of life, then we have something to offer to this lost world. And the way that he upholds us is by giving us a hope that is beyond the present. It is in the unseen. Faith is the substance, what stands under, substance, the underpinning of things hoped for. It, 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 it gets under us and holds us up. We have a hope beyond this world, whatever present suffering we may experience. It, it is the conviction of things not yet seen. We're looking for streets of gold, walls of jewels. We're looking for the kingdom. We're looking for the messianic uh, uh, reign in the earth. We're looking for that. Now, I want to challenge you. Maybe you're here this morning and you live without that hope. There's a difference between you and a believer who's suffering because that believer has an anchor. It says hope is an anchor to our soul. They have a biblical faith or something for them to hold on to. Yes, life may stink presently and it may be painful and the tears may flow. But somewhere in all of that, the Bible tells us that God, all of our wanderings are written down and that he takes all of our tears and then he keeps record of them. He has noticed them and we have not gone and, and been forgotten by him. That he is as painful for him as it is for us, for him to allow human history to roll onward. But he understands better than we do the implications of eternity. And for him then to allow human history to go forward, there will yet be others that will be saved and experience eternity in his presence instead of eternal separation. So he allows it. 
And the question that we have is, is why do the wicked prosper? Why does, are the righteous suffering? Why? It is the question of the ages of all believers from Abel to the end of the age. And we, we need an ability to look beyond the present and look beyond the visible. And that is the exercise of biblical faith. And it is directly connected to the promise, singular, that there is a Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is redeeming a people out of this painful existence and is establishing a kingdom where the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, where the lion and the calf will lay down together and the wolf and the lamb and the child will play in the adder's hole. There will be no sickness, no sorrow, no lawyers, no hospitals, no mental institutions, no cancer, no chemotherapy, no police, no war, no bombs. If you're here this morning and you don't have that hope, you need to ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sin and to be your Lord and Savior. Give your life to him. He doesn't want anything that you have. He wants what he has for you. If you are one of those that are downcast and wrestling with the fact that you feel like God has forgotten you or he's turned his back on you. We need to trust his written word above our emotions because our emotions will often betray us. And the Bible tells us, and I believe the, the reason the record is here is because he loves us.